Remember the Jetsons? Okay, it's probably a little before our time, at least for many people watching this video. Even Microsoft Word gave me the red squiggly line under the title. But not too long ago, shows like the Jetsons depicted a future full of exciting new technology, most memorably, the flying car. A few decades ago, kids grew up hoping to one day fly to work in their very own sky car, but that vision has clearly not become a reality. These days, that dream is all but forgotten. What happened to the flying car? To understand the public's fascination with flying cars, we have to travel back to the early days of automobiles. It might surprise you that one of the earliest proponents of the idea wasn't some eccentric inventor, but one of the great visionaries of automotive history, Henry Ford. The man behind the company responsible for such legends as the Model T, the GT40, and the mighty Pinto. As early as 1926, Ford sparked public interest in affordable aircraft for the everyman by producing a tiny single-seat plane called the Fliver, under the specifications that it fit inside his office. The Fliver prototype was a flop, heralded as a horrible craft, and accounted for one fatality, an employee and personal friend of Henry Ford, Harry Brooks. Regardless of the project's failure, the idea of cost-effective, privately-owned air transportation was a hit. The following decade saw several craft similar to the Ford Fliver, and in 1940 Ford himself stated, Mark my word, a combination airplane and motor car is coming. You may smile, but it will come. Lo and behold, in 1946 a man named Ted Hall, an employee with Consolidated Volte Aircraft, ignited public interest with his very own flying car prototype. The design was finally becoming a proper car-airplane hybrid, featuring a detachable wing and separate engines for the car and plane portions. Hall intended for civilians to own the car, but rent the wing from their local airport anytime they wanted to fly somewhere. Hall's initial prototype, dubbed the Convair Model 116, was a two-seater powered by a rear-mounted 26-horsepower engine for the car and an additional 90-horsepower engine to drive the plane portion's propeller. Not exactly a powerhouse of a vehicle, but it got the job done. The Model 116 successfully completed 66 test flights and was followed by a more refined Model 118, which featured a four-seat, plastic-bodied car driven by a 25-horsepower engine and a much more powerful 190-horsepower flight engine. Everything was going according to plan for the Convair car, until in November of 1947, human error threw a wrench in things. Test pilot Ruben Snodgrass, who was by all accounts a fantastic pilot, was forced to crash land the 118 in a field one hour into his flight. Snodgrass escaped with minor injuries, but the wing was damaged and the car was destroyed. The cause of the crash was pretty embarrassing for an experienced pilot like Snodgrass. Since the Model 118 was technically two separate pieces, it also had two separate fuel tanks. Before takeoff, Snodgrass had checked the car's fuel level, but had neglected to check the airplane's tank. The flight engine ran out of fuel and caused the crash landing. The company had a backup prototype to continue test flights, but the damage was done. Public interest in the project waned, and the Model 118 never made it into production. The Convair car showed that it was possible to create a hybrid plane automobile, and despite the project's failure, the idea of flying cars was still at the top of the list for projected future travel. Fast forward to the early 1970s, and we get another group keen to be the first to mass-produce this private air travel contraption. This company, based out of California, was known as Advanced Vehicle Engineers, or AVE, and their plan was very nearly identical to Hall's. They planned to mass-produce the airplane part of the vehicle to be rented out from airports around the country. The more interesting part of the story is that the car portion of their project was originally intended to be a Pontiac Firebird, perhaps in hopes of luring more people in with the temptation of a flying muscle car. However, that idea was scrapped, and the hybrid, which was dubbed the Mizar, ended up going with the infamous Ford Pinto. Like the Model 118, the Mizar very nearly made it into production, and human error once again dashed the hopes of all those behind the project at least those who survived. The flying Pinto was plagued by design and construction flaws, as test pilot Charles Janis discovered firsthand during a short flight in August of 1973. Not long after takeoff, the right-wing strut base mounting attachment failed, meaning the car was attached to the plane at only one side. Janis knew that if he tried to turn, the whole thing was liable to come apart. So instead, he flew straight and managed to land in a nearby bean field, and proceeded to drive the damaged Mizar back to the airport. Not one month later, and apparently undeterred by this critical design flaw, Mizar creator Henry Smolinski and Vice President of AVE Harold Blake conducted a test flight themselves. Unsurprisingly, the right-wing strut again detached from the Pinto. When Smolinski attempted to turn it around, the right-wing folded and sent the Mizar straight into the ground, resulting in an explosion that killed both executives, and with them, the Mizar project. Unbeknownst to the two unfortunate victims, they also supposedly ruined what could have been a very cool addition to the 1974 Bond movie, The Man with the Golden Gun. As before the crash, the film's bad guy was intended to escape in a Mizar. But after the accident, it ended up being replaced with a model. With the two biggest flying car projects ending in spectacular fashion, you'd think that the dream would have faded long ago. 
but there are still a few groups trying to get their prototypes off the ground, as it were. One such company, a small American corporation known as Terrafugia, is currently working on its own rotable airplane known as the Transition, which has been in development since 2006. Its primary function is as a light sport aircraft, but it has the ability to fold its wings for use on public roads, and it can travel at up to 70 miles per hour in normal traffic conditions. As successful, or rather disaster-free, as the Transition is, it hasn't exactly caused much excitement. Why is that? If you look at today's society, it's much different than when flying cars were a novel concept. Back in Henry Ford's day, automobiles were much more of a luxury than they are today, when it's not uncommon to see teenagers owning cars. The greater number of cars on the roads and the increased number of distractions like cell phones have shown us just how untrustworthy most people are behind the wheel. Putting those same people at the controls of a flying vehicle is unthinkable. However, driving as we know it is quickly becoming a thing of the past. Our cars seem to be more computer than machine these days, and that's changed the way we're approaching the transportation of the near future. We've now turned to such advancements as self-driving cars, which are creeping closer and closer to eliminating the need for human input entirely. This notion of vehicular autonomy is perhaps the saving grace of the flying car. If these vehicles had no option for human control, and were more akin to large transport drones than planes, we could potentially see a resurgence of the idea of personal air transport. Removing human error, the main cause for failure in past endeavors, could rekindle public interest in Jetson-style flying vehicles. The automotive landscape is changing. Who knows what we'll see in the future? If you'd like to learn more about the history of flying cars and current projects, check out the links in the description. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to keep up to date with the latest content. You can watch my previous video by clicking here, or watch them all by clicking here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.